share some of uh, our work uh, with you. So it is about non-additivity of molecule surface for the mass potentials from force measurements and also the reconstruction of the complete uh, surface. Um, and the mass direction, of course, are known for a long time. I mean, between atoms, the uh, formula has been uh, written down in 1930 by London, and for macroscopic bodies uh, by Lipschitz in 1956. And the intermediate range, where actually the uh, microscopic structure of matter is important, as well as these correlation forces, uh, the description is particularly challenging for theory, and so we need experiments here. For example, uh, regarding the interaction of the single molecules on the metallic surface, because this is, for example, important also for adsorption phenomena. Now, in order to measure this, of course, we cannot do with this uh, force apparatus from 1978, but I want to show you what our approach is to measure this. Our approach is essentially this one. We take the tip of a scanning probe microscope, contact the molecule just sitting on the surface, we go into contact, and then retract the tip pull the molecule off the surface, and while we do this, we can actually measure the force. Now, we are actually not from this community here, so we are not uh, usually working on van der Waals forces. Um, so our field is more like uh, trying to get uh, control over molecular manipulation, because we have the vision that at some point maybe we can turn our instruments into uh, molecular uh, fabrication robots. So it looks as if this is actually a very different background. However, if you want to do something like this, of course, you also need to understand very well the interactions between the molecules and the surface. And therefore, actually, it's quite close also. Um, so to give you sort of a summary at the beginning, you will show, I hope that I can show you, uh, uh, that um, in this type of experiment, we can do a fully quantitative measurement uh, of Van der Waals attraction between a single molecule of the surface, and by fully quantitative, I mean we can actually determine the power law, the validity range of the asymptotic power law, we can uh, track the position of the dynamic image plane, see three coefficients, and also actually find that the uh, Van der Waals attraction is not additive. So, there are a couple of prerequisites for, for these types of experiments. And the first one is, of course, we need a microscope which is, in the first place, able to show us individual molecules. So I show you here uh, this molecule uh, on the surface uh, uh, recorded with a scanning tunneling microscope at 5 Kelvin. This is sort of an island of many molecules. It's a separate one. Second uh, prerequisite is that we need to be able to make contact to our molecule. So the molecule actually needs a handle. And for this PTCDA molecule, which we often use, uh, we have these oxygen atoms here in the corner, which are quite reactive and which can actually be used to block the tip to them. Okay, and then there's actually a whole series of molecules uh, which all look similar and all have these handles here, starting from the small one, NTCDA, up to the big one, QTCDA. Now, of course, if you have such an image, the question is, where is now this oxygen atom in this image? And uh, in order to find out this, there are two different ways. First of all, you can go very close with your tip and scan across. And then you see each time the tip comes to an oxygen atom, this oxygen atom flips into contact. And you see some funny uh, things appearing in the image. So that's possibility number one. But there's also a more direct way, actually, of using a single molecule force sensors in your STM. And then you actually get full picture of the structure of the molecule, and then, of course, it's obvious uh, if you compare here this formula to the image where these oxygen atoms must be. And then you go there, approach the tip, and can make the contact. The third thing which we need, of course, is force sensing, because as we lift the molecule from the surface, we have to be able to measure the force. And here we actually use not a normal cantilever S, uh, AFM, but we actually use uh, a tuning fork AFM, so a dynamic AFM. So this is actually the tuning fork. You can see here the bar with the tip. And uh, these tuning forks have a frequency of about 30 kilohertz. And you make them oscillate with very small amplitudes, less than an angstrom. And if you do this, and you bring this tip close, and you f the tip actually feels some interaction, some attraction, then this leads actually to a frequency shift in the eigenfrequency of this um, tuning fork, 
and so if this is a general formula, but if the uh, amplitude is very small, then it actually turns out that this frequency shift, which you can measure, is directly proportional to the gradient in that direction of the force. So it is actually the stiffness of the junction and not the force which is measured, but of course you can calculate back from the stiffness to the force. Okay, so this is actually what an individual curves look like if you sort of come, make contact, remove the molecule, put it back, remove it again, do this about 40 times. Then each time we measure such a curve here. So, and the first thing you realize, of course, is that if you look at the lowering curve, which I put it down here, and the lifting curves, they are the same. So basically, the experiment is both reproducible and also reversible. Reproducible in the sense that you see very nice agreement. Uh, there's a little bit of statistical noise here in this area, which we understand also why it is there. But overall, it's a very reproducible and reversible experiment. This can also be seen if you look at the histogram. So now all the data points are plotted actually in one diagram here as a histogram, and you see very well defined actually behavior. Now the question is, what does this tell you? Remember, this is a frequency shift, it's a function of tip uh, position here. We are close to the surface here, we are far away from the surface. So we move out and go through this frequency shift curve. So in order to understand, so this is basically just uh, the average. In order to understand what uh, this curve tells us, we now basically integrate it once, because this gives us the force, and um, uh, then we get actually get this curve, and now we can actually compare this black curve, which is sort of the experimental result, with two limiting cases. They are plotted here as dotted and dashed curves. First of all, if we have a stiff rod, then we get actually two uh, maxima and the attractive force. And this happens when you first actually try to remove the molecule from the surface like this. You go through the first maximum and then force becomes small. And then if, you, if the molecule is upright and you try to remove it uh, completely, in the vertical position you go through the uh, second maximum. On the other hand, if the molecule was uh, sort of very floppy, and basically like a scotch tape, then you would observe here a very flat uh, feature in the force until the molecule is completely removed. And you see that the experimental curve actually lies between these two limits. Basically this tells you that the molecule has some flexibility, uh, so it's somewhere between the stiff rod and the scotch tape. And then actually by look, doing this analysis, you can um, assign individual stages of the experiment to this curve. And finally, of course, we can uh, integrate a second time and get actually measured. Okay, so this is sort of the qualitative understanding, which shows you that actually there's a lot of information about the process itself and the potential somewhere hidden in this curve. And we would like to extract this. So first of all, we need to extract the atomic positions during the manipulation process and also the potentials. And this is an inverse problem, so we have to do some simulation compare the simulation result to the experiment and then decide what is the best parameters of the simulation. And of course, uh, for this, we need sort of a potential um, which has uh, variables, which are the positions of the atoms in the molecule, but also some constraints, for example, to coordinate. And then we have to basically find uh, those coordinates which actually minimize this potential for a given set of constraints. The fitting strategy would be that for each potential you determine the positions throughout the complete manipulation process, and then you vary the potential until the agreement between experiment and theory is on. So for that we need the potential, and the potential obviously has three different contributions. There's the intramolecular potential, that's just the molecular mechanics, there's the molecular surface interaction, and there's the molecular tip interaction. And uh, the, the shape we use is this one here. The first four terms here are just the mechanics of the molecule, its bond, uh, distortion, potentials, angles, dihedral angles, and so on. And then there's the second uh, group of terms, this is now the molecular surface interaction, uh, which we split into a Z-dependent part and a corrugation, lateral corrugation part. So the first part, actually I would like to ignore this corrugation part because we are interested in now in this asymptotic behavior here, far away from the surface when the molecule is actually not feeling the lateral corrugation anymore, but just the attraction. And in 
this regime, in fact, uh, the force which we measure is totally um, dominated by the Van der Waals attraction. Now, of course, there are issues in these types of experiment. The first question is how do we actually know that the molecule is vertical in the junction when we have actually uh, broken the contact? I mean, certainly there is the attraction from the surface which tries to uh, minimize the overall distance, so it tries to actually put the molecule in the vertical. However, there's also attraction from the tip, obviously, and if the tip is asymmetric, then there could be a torque to one side. However, uh, thinking about this a little bit, you realize immediately uh, that the equilibrium, if there's an asymmetric tip, will be an unstable one, unlike this, uh, which is a stable equilibrium. So if this was dominating here, then we would, in fact, as we go away from the surface, at some point find that the molecule just flips up to the tip, and then we come back and actually don't see the molecule in the junction anymore. This sometimes does happen, uh, but in most cases it does not happen, as I've shown you. As I've shown you, in most cases the experiment is uh, reversible. And this tells us that we must be very close to this uh, vertical geometry, and so our assumption actually works, and we can. Uh, in this assumption. Second question is can we exclude electrostatic forces, of course, which would also be uh, present in principle. And there we know that actually this molecule, if you put it to gold, there's no charge transfer, there's no charging of the molecule, and uh, the assumption that there is only van der Waals is quite safe, and in fact it's borne out by the results in the end. Okay, so then, um, we have to basically come up with some uh, functional form of this van der Waals interaction where we use uh, the lipschitz zarenbar cohn result where we basically have individual atoms and we sum over the atoms and then there are these three coefficients and there's a z minus z0 over uh, to the power 3 um, dependence. And then z0 is in fact this dynamic image plane. So the three are the coefficients. And these are the positions of the individual atoms here. Okay, so the experiment again, we just go up and down many times, we do it for three different molecules, and then we get these curves here. Uh, so red now for the longest molecule, black for the shortest molecule, of course they are displaced on the axis because they have different length. And uh, now we actually want to basically fit this part here, which is uh, highlighted in gray because of the asymptotic behavior. And uh, so we plot the data. Uh, on this funny scale, uh, delta F frequency shift proportional to Z to the minus 5 and get a more or less a straight line. So this tells us, okay, this is not too bad because uh, remember this is the force gradient, so this should be Z to minus 5 uh, if the Van der Waals force is Z to the minus 3. And uh, so this is now the fitting strategy. Um, we fit all the three curves, anti-CD, PTCD, TTCD, at the same time using fit parameters, alpha, the different uh, uh, C3 coefficients for the different molecules, and Z0. Uh, and by actually having individual coefficients for the different molecules, we actually go beyond uh, the additivity because we allow the carbon atoms in the different molecules to actually use atomic weighting factors here because we have carbon atoms, hydrogen atoms, and uh, oxygen atoms from theory. Because in the end, you want to compare to this theory, so it makes sense to use the same weighting uh, logic system. Okay, so in the first step, we actually leave open the power and just look uh, which power gives us the best agreement with this theory. So this is actually the quality of the fit as a function of the uh, exponent. And you see uh, the minimum uh, in this uh, curve is close to alpha equal 3, which is, of course, what is expected if this is and we also see that for these alphas, actually, the Z0 value is close to what one expects from theory. So this shows us uh, that this is consistent and we probably have the right distance calibration as well. So then in the second step, we actually fix alpha to 3. Then we uh, fit these, uh, these three coefficients, and the result of the fit is actually shown here. And this yellow bar really uh, determines. I mean, it highlights where we actually start the fit. In this particular case, we started here. If you go a bit closer, 
then you see that the quality gets uh, 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 substantially worse. So we have to go, let's say, to about uh, five uh, angstrom, uh, smallest distance between the lower end of the molecule and the surface in order to get a, a stable fit here. And this shows us that this asymptotic behavior is actually valid only uh, for values larger than five angstrom. But then it actually reaches a plateau. And uh, the plateau it reaches actually uh, has the following property, that you get different C3 coefficients for different molecules. And um, this basically can be plotted like here. So you have uh, the, number of effective, uh, the effective number of carbon atoms in the molecule. And here you have the uh, atomic C3 coefficient. And you see as the molecule gets longer, actually this recursion coefficient gets also larger. And uh, you can look at the residual of the fit, which I just showed you. These are the uh, dark curves. If you uh, force the C3 coefficients in your fitting to be identical for the three molecules, then you get a substantially worse fit here, showing by these residuals. So really, um, it is an experimental finding that the carbon atoms in this TTCDA molecule here are more polarizable than the carbon atoms NDCDA. So this means the van der Waals interaction is not additive over the carbon atoms. Now we can compare this result to a theory. So first of all, we choose the DFT plus semi empirical van der Waals surf scheme, which was developed by Alex Sachenko, who's in the audience, and his co workers. And uh, we find that the overall size of the coefficients we get is actually very well. Uh, very good agreement with theory, but by construction of this particular theory, actually, the C3 coefficients should all be roughly the same for the different molecules, because you start from an isotropic free atom static polarizability, which is volume scaled only for the immediate to chemical environment. So we can get from this comparison that the values of our <coughs> coefficients are quite OK. However, we can't really compare uh, this linear behavior. But we can do this if you go to a different type of theory, which is DFT combined with random phase approximation. And there we get a very nice agreement actually with predicted superlinearity. Now the question is what is the origin of the superlinearity? And in this RPA calculation you start actually uh, from this microscopic response function of the molecule, density density response function, which you evaluate in first order perturbation theory of the wave functions. And then actually in this expression here, you have those uh, energies here. These are uh, the lowest energy which actually appears is this homolumo gap. So the gap, energy gap between the lowest unoccupied and the highest occupied molecular level. As a molecule gets longer, this gap actually gets smaller. For an infinitely long molecule, it's pretty metallic. There will be no gap left anymore. <coughs> Which means that actually for the longer molecule, this density-density response function is actually getting larger. This is in fact then the uh, origin of the superlinear rise, which is shown really nicely by this plot, because if you exclude this energy difference, the homolumo gap, from your calculation, then instead of the red, cur uh, red dots, you get these gray dots. Basically, you don't have this uh, um, superlinear rise anymore. So it's basically to do with the fact that for the longer molecules, the electrons get more deconfined in this long axis of the molecule, uh, and this actually decreases the homolumen gap and this increases the polarizer. Now, of course, uh, this effect of superlinear rise of, of polarizability is known from optics experiments shown here for this uh, polymer. If you make n larger, you actually go up quite substantially here in your alpha. Compared to this, our effect is rather small, and uh, the question is why this is. And this is also understood from the theory because uh, this superlinear rise in the atomic polarizability actually is something which happens at zero frequencies, yeah. static polarizability, whereas for larger frequencies, actually, this difference actually washes out. And since the uh, van der Waals force actually uh, you know, sums of all these frequencies effect is smaller than in the case of optics where you obviously see the one. Okay, so this is sort of uh, the asymptotic potential. Now let's look at this part of the curve, 
where some more information about the short range potential should also be embedded. So, uh, and to get an idea how we can actually fit there, let's actually go back to this uh, plot here, which shows uh, how uh, the fit evolves as we go closer and closer and closer to the surface. Yeah? Before we looked at this plateau here, because that's where the asymptotic uh, behavior is established, but if we go closer, we see that two things happen. First of all, the Z0, this image plane, moves closer to the substrate, and the C3 coefficients get larger. From this observation, we sort of infer that for the close distance, we should replace this expression here by this expression here. So we basically set this one to zero, as seems to appear here. We also go to some effective C3 coefficients, which should be larger. If you then actually use this formula now for the close range and also add sort of a chemical bonding term, exponential and power repulsion, also exponential, <coughs> and then redo the fit, then we get this type of result. So again, I show you the histogram for the experiment. This is now simulations of the experiment with uh, potentials from the previous full graph. There's 4,000 uh, 4, different uh, parameters. And you see that overall the agreement is very nice. And the best curve here, which fits uh, from the theory, which fits this one best, actually shows a, a C3, effective C3 of about 70 kilocalories, mm -hmm. kilocalories per mole, uh, angstrom to the power of 3. And this is precisely the value to which this curve here will uh, down uh, actually extrapolates. This means that actually we have now two branches of our potential, one for far distances and one for close distances, which match at about four to five uh, uh, angstrom uh, height, and uh, which basically uh, match seamlessly. So you can actually sort of interpolate between those and get full attractive synthesis potential from these types of uh, measurements. Okay, so one thing, of course, which you can then do directly is to evaluate the absorption energy of the molecule because you now have the potential to just put the molecule in the position where it is uh, absorbed on the surface without tip. Then you see that for the potentials which give the best agreement with the uh, frequency shift curves, you uh, arrive at a binding energy about 2.5 e, uh, electron volts, which is a reasonable agreement with... Uh, theoretical expectation. And uh, more importantly, of course, you can also do a uh, dissection now. You can basically partition this energy between the different types of uh, interactions. For example, Pauli, which is repulsive, chemical interaction, which turns out in this case zero expectedly to the dispersive interaction, which is about uh, 80 to 90 millivolt per atom in this particular case, PCA. Uh, Okay, now um, our idea was to basically study these manipulation experiments. If you think about this, actually, this corrugation, uh, which holds the lower end of the molecule in place, is quite important to establish some controlled manipulation routines. And therefore, we now want to actually look at the self corrugation and how this will actually change our interpretation of the data. So now we will actually forget about uh, this uh, cross here and actually include our correlation, uh, sorry, our corrugation potential. And so uh, this has one important uh, implication, and this can be seen in this uh, simple scheme where you replace the molecule by a bar, a rigid bar with some elasticity, and then the lower end of the molecule is actually sitting in some simple corrugation. And uh, since we measure the force gradient in that direction by going up and down, by basically vibrating this thing up and down, it's clear that especially in the more upright configurations, um, the existence of this uh, potential here in the lateral dire direction will lead to some apparent revulsive force, which we measure here in the vertical direction. This is in fact what we see. If we integrate our curve, because beforehand I showed you this curve, 
and I said I integrated the curve and then I get this. This is what I showed you when we discussed the results qualitatively. However, at that stage I had already applied some corrugation correction and if I take the data as measured, uh, the black curve here, I would in fact see here an apparent repulsive force. Which of course is unphysical in the z-direction, there is no repulsion in the z-direction, but it comes uh, because we measure this uh, uh, force rating in a particular way, which basically translates some of the lateral information on the potential into the vertical. This, by the way, is also the reason why it's not possible in order to get the absorption energy to just integrate this curve, because you always have this apparent repulsive force which uh, um, fortifies your result then. But of course, you can take this into account now, once you have identified this problem, and um, can calculate this correction. I don't want to go into details, but basically, if you do this, you can come up with simulated curves which in all generic uh, properties fully reproduce what the experiment shows. So the experimental curve is the red one, just one particular curve for one particular experiment, and uh, the black curve is just one particular simulation, and you see uh, that the overall shape, including these uh, jerky events, and also the broadness of this peak here comes out very nicely. So what we can say is that we have actually a, a valid description of the full manipulation process. Okay, this brings me to the end of my talk. I hope I've shown you that if you use these molecules with a handle and STM and AFM, you can do highly reproducible manipulation experiments, which allow you to measure the van der Waals energy of a single molecule of metal surface. And uh, if I say measure, I mean that we can actually determine the asymptotic component, we can determine the reference plane position, we can determine the validity range of this exponent, we can determine the absolute size of these coefficients, and also get out and that's about 10% of uh, superlinearity respectively non additivity If we actually change a little bit the equation, we can also go to this close distance, and in this way then by a combination of the two, construct the full surface holding potential. We can, for example, determine the absorption energy of an individual molecule removed from the surface, which is interesting because in surface science, uh, up to now, there has been no way to actually measure the absorption energy of a single molecule. You can do this by, uh, for an ensemble of molecules, of course, by thermal absorption. Um, but here, we can actually look at a single molecule. We can petition the bonding energy again something which uh, uh, you cannot do if you work with thermal desorption spectroscopy. And finally, uh, at the very end, I've shown you the lateral corrugation it uses uh, the of force, jerky sliding, and um, finally also uh, force field simulations are used, described in the inflation process completely, if they are properly trained on data sets like this, so if you determine the parameters correctly, uh, and this means that now by the combination of these experiments which work very well with simulations which also work very well, new chances, uh, new opportunities actually appear. And one of these opportunities is for example the following. So you can now use motion control uh, devices basically which, um, you know, these are cameras which uh, can basically track uh, the movement of your hand. And uh, if you give this signal then to this tip, then you can actually take the molecule basically in your hand. So you move your hand, <laughs> and actually the tip does the same and picks up the molecule uh, as you move it with your hand. And uh, since we have the simulation, this can be combined then with some virtual reality because at the same time that the experiment runs or the simulation runs, the image of the simulation is actually projected into this uh, virtual reality goggle, and basically then you come to a situation where you can move the molecule and see what it does while you're moving it. This is of course a vision, we're not quite there yet, uh, but at least this is something which we believe could be very helpful in uh, learning how to work in a very controllable and reasonable way with these types of molecules.
you want to learn more about this, you can actually watch this movie here on Feinstein TV, Moving Molecules by Hand. Yeah, finally, I would like to acknowledge, of course, my co-workers, Ruslan Timirov, Christian Wagner, Matthew Green, and Philip Hein, who have worked in sort of on the experiments. We've had some collaborations with the group in Münster, and also with Alexander Chitenko. And regarding those experiments, some of the molecules we produce are done by Klaus Müller and the Max Planck Institute in Mainz. This I would like to thank you for your attention. In fact, this little movie here is a movie where basically we remove individual molecules from this carpet here by this hand control manipulation. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs>
And type A was uninteresting, I won't talk about it. Type B uh, was basically the third molecule can screen the interaction between uh, another two, uh, screen the Coulomb interaction. This gives rise, for example, to axle rod, tell a three body, and so on, higher and higher. So that's what I call type B, a basically classical electrostatic screening effect. Type C non-additivity, where, whereby the total band of is not the sum of pairs of atoms, was attributed in my paper to hopping of electrons between atomic centers. And if I've understood what you've told us today, which I think is new from your last version of this talk, you've told us by doing a full RPA calculation and noticing that the energy denominators get small when electrons are able to hop for long distances, you've confirmed that what you've seen is type C non-additivity definitely due to the ability of electrons to hop between centers. And I think, uh, from a theorist's point of view, uh, this is an additional important thing, you know, on top of all the, the important technological implications of what you've done. So I'm, I'm, I'm extremely, extremely happy with what, what you've found. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I agree, actually. I think, uh, I mean, the molecule gets longer in one direction, which means that the electrons are getting deconfined in this direction, and this basically increases the polarizability in this direction. So, I mean, these molecules all have anisotropic polarizabilities, and this linear rise, which we see in the C3 coefficients, is due to the increasing polarizability along the long axis of the molecule. Good. Uh, one more. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe a naive question. How do you make sure that the atoms of the tip, they don't contribute to the C3? Well, this is also relatively straightforward. I can show you. Okay, here. So, of course, initially when we approach, the molecule is not yet connected to the tip. We have just the metal tip and we approach. And then actually we measure this black curve, right? And you can see this here. The curves which we measure once the molecule is connected to the tip are, is the red one here. But of course we, what we can do is in order to stoop the influence of all the metal atoms from the tip is we just subtract from the red curve the black one. And this is actually the blue curve. And everything else, I do is always based on this background subtractive blue curve. 